Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. When Bill de Blasio takes over as mayor on January 1st, his will not be the only branch of government with a new look. The 51-member city council will have 21 new members, meaning a new speaker, new committee chairs, and new political figures who, who can be expected to be players on the civic stage for decades to come. We are a long way from the days when Henry, when Henry Stern, then a council member and later a parks commissioner, rebuffed labeling the city council as a rubber stamp, since at least a rubber stamp leaves an impression. Even under outgoing Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who was closely allied with Speaker Christine Quinn, the council exercised its, its power to enact sick leave legislation, alter development plans, and to try to rein in controversial police stop and frisk policies. Whether they help Mayor de Blasio carry out the, um, the ambitious agenda he has promised, or they strike an independent path that, that confronts some of his goals, that is what government and politics is all about. We're joined by four of those 21 new members. Each of the four took separate paths to the council, but they are not political neophytes. Vanessa Gibson has spent the last four years as a member of the State Assembly, representing the Bronx neighborhoods of Claremont, Highbridge, Mount Eden, and Morris Heights. She was just elected to the council to take, to take the seat that had been held by term-limited Helen Foster and which overlaps her assembly district. Carlos Menchaca has worked for Brooklyn Borough President Marty Markowitz and in the council speaker's office and will be the city's first Mexican-American elected official and Brooklyn's first openly gay legislator, representing a Brooklyn district based in Sunset Park, where he accomplished, where he accomplished something very rare in city politics. He defeated an incumbent. Mark Traeger is the, son of, is, is the son of Ukrainian immigrants and a Brooklyn College graduate. He is a social studies teacher at New Utrecht High School and a veteran of, of, of Brooklyn political wars. He was a Democratic Club president at the age of 21 and cut his political teeth working with Brooklyn Assemblyman Bill Colton. He takes the seat held by term-limited Dominic Recchia. Mark Levine, a teacher and longtime activist, won handily in a multi-candidate field to take a seat stretching from Manhattan's, west, from Manhattan's west side through West Harlem to Washington Heights. And Mark is, among other things, going to be my council member. So I better be nice to him, <laughs> yes. or maybe he has to be nice to me. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Now, while Mark is, is bilingual and is as comfortable in Spanish as in English, the question he and his new colleagues are about to confront is, can they speak City Hall, which is a language all of its own? Um, I was a reporter for 21 years. Let me start right with the most uncomfortable question. Uh, who, I mean, I assume you all have been spending a lot of time listening to people who are running for speaker, an election where you have to get 26 votes out of 51 members. With all due respect to all of us, we're kind of irrelevant in this mm. process. How has this experience been? Do you have a, do you have a candidate you're supporting? A well, candidate you're not supporting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... This is, a, this is Mark Traeger, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I, I have an interesting situation because I'm still teaching. Uh, so uh, meetings are being are postponed, I guess, for a while. I'm still teaching five classes. Uh, and uh, so, but, you know, to me, we were all here elected to represent neighborhoods. You know, the city is, is made up of neighborhoods. And um, my, my main responsibility will be to service those neighborhoods. I, I have areas that were hurt by Superstorm super Sandy. Uh, people are still hurting, still displaced. So each of us will bring our issues and our needs from the district to the, ta to the table. Uh, so I look forward to this process of meeting with the speaker candidates. It, sh it should be a very engaging process. Uh, but to me, um, it's, it's already getting hectic. There, there's been requests for meetings and so forth. That there are forums going, going on. And I will meet with all the speaker candidates and make it, make it clear that there are very, very uh, big, big needs uh, in, in our districts, which to me supersede politics. And uh, the speaker uh, should be someone who has statesmanship, who really cares about these issues. Because to me, my philosophy is that public service begins with an honest desire to help people. So to me, it's about doing the right thing by the constituents that, that, that elected us. So that's what I bring to the table. And that's what I'll be sharing with the speaker candidates. And I look forward to hearing I their I couldn't response. agree more with Mark, actually. And I'm taking advantage of this opportunity to bring <coughs> the speaker candidates to Red Hook, where we were also devastated right. by Sandy. And I'm walking them through the neighborhood so they can understand the issues that we're facing now. And Sandy is going to be one of the things that a lot of us are going to be bringing into the city council. And I'm walking them to the boilers, uh, the temporary boilers that are in NYCHA connecting, uh, uh, connecting hot water and heat to, to the buildings. Uh, they're going to be there for several winters, and that can't happen. And we need some action, and we need some action now. So I'm taking an opportunity to get to know the, the speaker candidates uh, through the issues that are happening in our district. 
Right. Look, the biggest storyline this year for me, it's a group that both Carlos and I are part of, it's the Progressive Block. This is a group of 20-plus council people, freshmen and returning, who have decided to try and rewrite the rules of how we pick speakers in New York City. Traditionally, this is a process that emerges out of deals made between county leaders, uh, where they're trading on key committee assignments and patronage jobs. But the ideology of the council speaker is generally secondary or perhaps not even included in the, in the debate. And we want to change that. We want to turn this process on the head. We want to get a speaker who is deeply committed to progressive values, to reform of the city council. And we have assembled a block that will be the largest single block in the city council that's going to make sure that we advance this agenda in the speaker's race. The Bronx has um, been on a county level, has been a player in, in selecting past speakers, <laughs> not with any right. success. And the last one was kind of a, one well, of no, the last one was kind of a Brooklyn, mm -hmm. was a, a Queens Bronx deal, if you will. I mean, do you feel countervailing pressures from the Progressive Caucus and from your, and from your uh, county delegation? I do, and I think that the Bronx will have a major um, stake at the table. Um, for many years, the Bronx has been the outer borough that has been shortchanged, and me representing Bronx County, understanding that we have a huge unemployment. We have a devastation of just people who have been living in poverty for many years. We have inequity in our educational system and, you know, just the health care industry. And so for me, coming from the assembly, from Albany and the politics there, coming down to the city council, I'm absolutely looking to, to be a part of a lot of that reform to really make sure that whoever we support for speaker is someone that can cultivate that network. Someone that understands that we are a city of five diverse boroughs and the outer boroughs that are outside of Manhattan need preference and we need priority. Um, so I do feel that pressure, but at the end of the day, I was elected by the residents and voters of the 16th district, and those are the people that I will have at the top of my conversation. Uh, Mark, I want to continue this. I think this is an interesting discussion, is the, the kind of the countervailing, you know, are you in this decision, which is unlike any other decision you're going to have to make, which is the decision of the speaker, uh, it's your first vote. And it could determine how politically effective, you know, if speakers, you know, speakers can be vindictive, speakers can be good hearted. You know, we don't know how this is going to work out. But the same, do you feel a Brooklyn tug? Do you feel an issue tug? I mean, how are these forces playing out to you? To me, I think, you know, I think it's smart to, to speak to all the stakeholders. Uh, and to me, uh, I'm speaking to everyone. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of overlap with what the issues tug is versus what the county organization tug is. They're, on many issues, I think they're, they're aligned, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, many they are. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's, it's more about maybe, I think uh, Councilman Levine mentioned it correctly, that sometimes it's just about deal making or, or, or some, some sort of that. But, but to me, um, I made this clear to some of the candidates already. I make it clear to all of them who I meet with. There are certain issues that, to me, supersede politics. And if there's anything that we've learned uh, in, in this past uh, decade with the uh, Bloomberg and Quinn relationship is that you have to cut through the politics and you have to meet the needs of people. Mm -hmm. And you have to come across as a person who truly cares about public service. And that's, to me, uh, the quality that I'm looking for, for the most. I'm not looking for a wheel or dealer. I'm looking for again, someone that really uh, comes to me as a person who really wants to do the job and uh, not just make a name for themselves, but really listen to, to the needs and concerns of the council members, because really, we're their constituents. We will elect the speaker, and someone who is accessible, open, uh, hears us and addresses the needs of, of, our, of our constituents. Mark, let me pick on you, since you're the one who kind of brought up the uh, Progressive Caucus. Um, when you saw the um, you know, deals, arrangements, whatever word you want to use, that, that led to the selection of of Gifford Miller, that led to the selection of Christine Quinn, that led to the selection of Peter Vallone, if you want to go back far enough. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, in, in the case of Christine Quinn, this is conventional wisdom, which is always conventional, not always wise, is that, you know, she got the support of Queens County, and it's 12 votes, I think, at the time, and Queens County was given, you know, one of their members was given land use, one of their members was given finance, that, you know, you know these are powerful committees that help drive drive the agenda in the you know in the city council which is both more power you know it's not as we're still a mayor centered government but it still is a much more powerful council than than, than we were kids before the 89 charter so i mean are there countervailing forces now of course you're from manhattan and it's, you know it's kind of the old 
You know, mm -hmm. it's the old Will, it's the old Will Rogers line that I, have, I don't belong to any organized party. I'm a Democrat. So Manhattan is kind of, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't have the kind of discipline that you've seen in Brooklyn, that you've seen in, in the Bronx and you've seen in Queens. So, I mean, how, I mean, is it, tell me about these countervailing forces. Well, look, uh, I'm concerned that we get people of the highest integrity and of the greatest ability chairing these key committees. I hope it will only be, I hope it will not only be about horse trading. And I'm really concerned that we get a council that's more democratic, small d democratic, mm -hmm. that is more transparent and open and where members have the ability to move a bill to the floor. People might be shocked to hear that a, a, a chair of a committee in the House of Representatives, which we think is so dysfunctional, has much more power and flexibility than the chair of a committee in the New York City Council to get a hearing and a vote on legislation. Um, the way that we dole out discretionary money in the New York City County. Member items. Right, and, and mm -hmm. member items. It's deeply undemocratic. Uh, it's not based on the need of, of any given community. It's based on the political standing of the council member. And, those council members who do the bidding of the speaker traditionally have gotten lots of money for their district, and those who have dared to stand up have gotten very little. And, and that's, would you that's support? Unfair. I'm going to ask each of you. Would you support? Listen, you know, talking about member items, some districts have greater needs than other. Would you? Would you support everybody gets the same amount of money as a member item, which does not take into account? I mean, you have, a, you know, I mean, in particular, you have districts that are, you know, your district has a, has a lot more needs than, than, than some other districts right. in the city. So should it be everybody gets the same amount? Well, I, uh, I like the idea and the concept of a needs formula. The challenge is how do you identify what the real need is and how do you characterize that? I mean, looking at my district and the fact that the AMI is less than $30,000, I would say my district in the Bronx is of high need. Median income. With right. the median income. And, you know, Looking at some of the reforms and a lot of what people have said, it's important to, to agree to these types of things, but make sure that there's actually a concrete way to define so, that. So, we're, so, you know, let me pin you down a little bit. The, so the idea of everybody gets the same amount of money does not appeal to you because you think it's unrealistic to what the needs of your district Absolutely. are. Absolutely. I mean, do you, how do you all feel about that? The important thing is that there's transparency and openness. Right. No, but what about this? But one of the proposals out there is to make it an equal, you oh, know, that, that the way to be fair is to just divvy it up 51 ways. Or, or to establish a floor and then allow for extra money for people with large low-income communities or seniors or other high-needs populations. Uh, I think that's fairness. But as long as it's open and we know the formula, then we take the politics out of it. There are some people who argue that member items, them by by their very nature, are you know that if something is wor is worth funding, that it should be funded centrally by the city. That why should you have these things that are kind of off budget? I mean, you know, this is not something that goes through a normal budget procedure. And so there are you know the newspaper editorial boards and stuff say those should be put into the central budget. You shouldn't have members individually rewarding friends in their community and not rewarding friends in their community. Not only the speaker you know, dealing with rewards and punishment among council members, but the way you have the power, the authority, the power and the authority to reward people and not reward people in your, in your district. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that's necessarily what um, I envision happening. Many of our community groups and our CBOs that are providing critical services to families and children don't have grant writers that can compete with some of the larger organizations. Right. So if you look at something like Early Learn NYC that came out of the ACS that was awarding daycare providers money, a lot of our smaller minority based providers were cut out of that process. So what I think council members do through the member item process is they really try to complement what city agencies should already be doing. Um, it's a little frustrating sometimes with many of our schools that are in neighborhoods that don't have gymnasiums. The Department of Ed should have a budget that provides phys ed in schools and gymnasiums. So why should council members have to necessarily fund a gymnasium when that should already be included? So while I think that, you know, there has to be drastic change with a more open process that allows to see, you know, in terms of what's going on, I do think that council members have to really uh, complement what city agencies are doing and not necessarily award their friends. One thing I can say is I'm not related to anyone that is a CBO provider in my <laughs> district, um, mm -hmm. but I simply would like to continue to allow these organizations to support and provide services to my district. Um, I mean, the other argument, of course, and you know, I happen to personally, you know, I'm being a little bit of devil's advocate here, I happen to think member items are the way that you can help out of organizations right. that don't come to the attention of, right. of center that you know you know i mean i happen to think that they're um that that they do kind of grease a lot of the direct services that people get through nonprofit organizations right. but what about this question should they be uh, divvy should they be divvied up evenly 
for example, I, I, I toured a park in my district where uh, they, they, re they drastically reduce um, the hours where the bathrooms are open. So you have children who come after school to go to their local park and they don't have a bathroom to use, and senior citizens who really are medication who need to use, use a restroom, they don't have access to that. Uh, does Central know about that? How would they know about that? So that's something that I personally know. I visit the parks, I visit the schools. Uh, I know where, where, which schools need basic supplies. As a teacher, I could tell you we're always short on certain supplies, short on technology. They're actually measuring us on how much technology we use in our schools, but don't, don't give us the money to, to fund technology enhancements in our schools. So that's something that I, as the councilman, would, would bring back to the council and during budget negotiations and say, listen, this, these are the needs of people in my district. So, so to me, I, I, one thing I will say, what should not happen is what happened, I think, with, with a council member from Queens, I think um, Crowley, I believe it was, where she might have voted against the speaker's interests of some sort, and they stripped her of her funding to senior centers or something uh, uh, in her district. That should not happen. Because you're not just, you're not punishing the member, you're punishing the people in that district. You're punishing the senior citizens who rely on that funding for, for vital programs. So that to me should That's not happen. Right. Right. Well, I want to take this into another direction right. because there's something really beautiful happening in New York City, and that's through participatory budgeting. And I yes. don't know how many people have heard about that, but that's coming to the 38th District. And we're allowing for the public to be part of this process, this member item process. And so I'm allocating $2 million into this process that allows for the community mm -hmm. to come together around an idea. Uh, it could be a new court in the NYCHA housing. It could be uh, air conditioners for a senior center. It could be a new section of the park that hasn't been renovated in years. And so we're allowing community members to come together and saying this is what we want and to allow other community members to vote on these projects at the end of the day. And so the top vote getters will get funded uh, through, through these member items, through either, uh, this is a capital budget process, but uh, this is something that needs to, I think, happen in the city council to allow government to give uh, power over to the people to make decisions on their own. And, and this is the, the second part to this conversation, is I think we do need member items and we do need uh, the public to be part of that process and conversation. It's gonna be more transparent and more uh, about building our communities together. Well, what about the idea of splitting it up evenly? Uh, how do you mean? Well, I mean, should you, you have a pot of money, you get- Are you talking about- X, X millions of dollars <laughs> set aside for discretionary funding at the end of the budget process. Should that be divvied up 51 ways? Uh, I, I think that I mean equally in 51 ways. Right. So. No, I, I, th I think what we what we need to do is I think Mark had a good idea about. By the way, this conversation needs to be happening with the 51 members, and we're going to have that conversation. Mm, don't and and what's exciting about it is that all of us are going to bring a different idea and trajectory. But a base floor would be good because I think every district has need. But we all have our different needs, and uh, for us affected by Sandy, that's a that's a huge uh, undertaking yeah. for for budget and, and federal dollars are about to come down in from uh, federal dollars are about to come down to our communities and we need to make sure that those dollars are, are, are doing the, the work that they're supposed to be doing, empowering uh, through economic development our local uh, our local residents. You're the first Mexican American yes. elected in the city. Yes. Um, you know, and in, in my time covering covering politics and stuff, we saw the first a uh, Jamaican woman in Una Clark. We saw um, Guillermo Linares as the first Dominican right. elected. We saw the, uh, John Liu as the first Asian American elected mm -hmm. citywide. We saw David Dinkins elected as the first African American mayor. How, uh, you know, as, as we progress, there are fewer firsts. And so, I mean, is, was that important in driving your election? You know, it, it became something that, that I understood more and more when I was interacting with our, our volunteer base, for example. And so many of our volunteers were uh, undocumented moms that wanted better schools in their community, um, that brought their, 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 their sons and daughters who had just turned 18 or 23, and we registered them to vote. And they had never thought about voting before and got involved in the campaign. I understood that from a policy side and, and the first, but I understood that differently when I saw Mexican uh, folks from Sunset Park, but also from the Bronx, actually, they came down and volunteered uh, on a weekly basis. And so I understood the, the reality of the, of the importance of this voice coming to the city council uh, and, and really into politics, because we are one of the largest growing uh, populations in this, in this, uh, in this city. Uh, and and we, we do need a voice in, in government w without any doubt. 
the, the, the plight of the immigrant right now and the immigrant families are so real and all of us are experiencing that through our own ways in our, in our districts. Uh, and it's, it's just great that now we have a Mexican voice in the city council. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're the son of Ukrainian immigrants. And, um, you know, I mean, your district doesn't go into Brighton Beach, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct. No. And, but, you know, because we've seen the rather chaotic Russian, uh, Russian politics that go, you know, um, you know, within the Russian community. That's kind of difficult for an outsider to understand. But I mean, it's the same kind of a question. Well, they had redrawn all the districts, right? right. And they, they drew a super Russian district neighboring my district, which covers, uh, that district covers uh, Brighton Beach, Sheepshead Bay. Over to Marine Park, I think. Yes, in Midwood. Uh, but the irony is that my district elected the first Russian-speaking member to the New York City Council. Yagavaru mm Poruski. -hmm. I speak Russian. <laughs> uh, I, I was born here, first-generation American, but my parents are from Ukraine, from former Soviet Union, and uh, it's 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 a big deal for us for us in my community. And Why? I mean, the same kind of question. Uh, I think is it because now is there some official imprimatur that says we are part of the city in a way that we weren't before? I, I think it represents the next chapter in, in our story. Uh, I mean, the, the, first, the first part is always coming here and trying to adapt and adjust to a new country, trying to make ends meet, scrambling to find jobs, to support your family, going to school. I mean, my, my parents came here, typical immigrant story, no money, but a lot of luggage and dreams for their family. And they said, you know, work hard, play by the rules, take school very seriously. Education was very big, as it is for all of our families, and uh, success would be possible. And so this represents now the next chapter. Not only are we now getting more active, uh, we're working, we're being productive members of society, but we're now electing someone, you know, the, the son of immigrants. And I think that, that's a great, you know, for me as a teacher, to be able to both teach and live the American dream, that is simply a very special experience. Uh, Vanessa, you've, uh, you know, you've, you've been in the assembly. You understand the kind of push and pull that mm -hmm. goes into you know, coming up with a budget, coming up with legislation. In, in your situation, you have a, uh, a Senate which is kind of controlled by kind of nobody or everybody. Two Senates. Two, you have, <laughs> you have two different Senates because of the independent caucus. Um, you've had the experience of ideology running up against reality. Um, you know, you know in, an, in an ideal universe, if there was unlimited amounts of money, if there was a hugely growing pot, there's, there's a lot more you can do. Um, at some point, you have to say no. I mean, a speaker has to say no, a mayor has to say no, and you're going to have to kind of work around that no. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that, because everybody's talking about big, about big ideas. Right. Meanwhile, you know, we have an $8 billion, you know, mm -hmm. we have an $8 billion back union contract hole yep. in the city. Which I mean, there's some, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, reality is not what it's cracked up to be. I right. guess. So, I mean, you know, you've had experience with that. They have not had experience of actually having to look at, look at those numbers. What kind of advice do you have for them? The first piece of advice I have is to really never give up. I mean, there's always, always something that's possible. We live in a political world where nothing happens overnight. Um, being in Albany for four years and working under first Governor Patterson and now Governor Cuomo, it's been a challenge. I'm in a house of 105 Democrats, and I'm one voice of 105. We have a speaker that's been able to demonstrate tremendous leadership under extreme circumstances, and I was able to find a voice. Um, I spoke up when needed. I fought for the right issues education, everything that mattered to my district, and I felt that I had a voice and it made a difference. Um, next year, it will be a challenge because one thing that we have to be cognizant of is 2014 or state elections. The governor, the comptroller, the attorney general, and all of our state legislators are up for re-election. So that has to be factored into the conversation. That doesn't mean that nothing is impossible, it just means that we may have to try a little bit of creativity. Um, Mayor-elect de Blasio has come up with this tax the rich concept, which I've always been supportive of, because I think wealthier New Yorkers need to pay their fair share when you talk about education for our school kids, supporting the disabled, and health care, and, and so many issues. particular preschool and absolutely. School in the case of so that, I think, we can have that conversation. Um, we may have to tweak it a little bit to get what we want at the end of the day, but I think working with 
with the mayor and his approach and his relationship with the governor is very helpful. This is all about relationships and this is about really bringing to the table the your priority list of what you want and being able to compromise within that list, but never forgetting what your priorities are. Same thing to you. I mean, uh, you know, no is not a word you like to use in a campaign. What is it? Mario mm -hmm. Cuomo said you campaign in poetry and you govern in, and you govern in prose. Um, it's not an unlimited pot. And you, you know, you can come, and this is where a speaker, you know, a speaker is a leader and has to make decisions mm -hmm. that kind of bring everybody together. And you may not like everything, every element of what he or, of what he or she is going to do, and you're going to have to say no to people. Well, it's about priorities, Bob. And this has been an era when segments of this city have been left behind. Uh, the homeless population is at an all-time high, at a moment when the stock market is also at an all-time high. How's that for a contradiction? Uh, we've it's seen not a contradiction. Well, it's, 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 right. an it's an unac unacceptable reality, in my opinion. Right. Ten tenants are under siege in low-income neighborhoods all over the city. Uh, Low-wage workers, uh, hundreds of thousands, are living at or near minimum wage. Uh, these are segments of our city which I think all of us here are deeply committed to serving. And that's going to require changes in our budget. Uh, it's going to require different priorities. And it's going to require a willingness to raise new revenue where appropriate by a surcharge on those of us who are making half a million dollars or more and other forms of revenue. Uh, and I think it's going to be possible to change some of the Bloomberg administrative practices, such as relying less on outside contracting, mm -hmm. um, a practice which has cost the city hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. um, most notoriously in the city time scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, bring some of those resources back home to our own city workforce. We can more effectively serve some of these populations which have been, which have been left behind for many years now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Good. Um, same, same. Uh, actually, yeah. I, I also want to make sure that people who are supposed to be paying what they're, what they're paying are actually paying what they're supposed to be paying. Because uh, when I used to work for uh, someone, Colton, um, every year he'd hear the same story from Albany. You know, it's either cut vital services to, to, you know, uh, in the state or raise taxes. It's always that uh, budget dance. So I asked the question. I said, well, are, is everyone paying what they're supposed to pay? And you know, he, he said that's what's worth researching. So we did some research. And little did we know, at the, at this, during this time, this was after the Wall Street uh, you know, meltdown, uh, Lehman Brothers, former Wall Street giant, owed New York State over $1.2 billion, with a B, dollars in back taxes. And my first reaction was, how is that possible? If any of us owed $100 to anybody, they'd be at your door already uh, demanding the money. Well, that's the old expression that if you owe the bank a thousand dollars, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank a million dollars, you own the bank. So, <laughs> so w w when you look at this, and and you know, we began to ask and grill the the tax uh, department about this, and you know, probably not a million, probably a billion now. But, <laughs> but, <that's, laughs> but you know, the, the answer eventually was was that they have good tax attorneys. They tie up the state in court. And by the time you know you get to court, they, they keep appealing and so forth, and. So they go after the, 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 the little guy who might owe uh, $1,000 or so forth, but we can't afford the best tax attorneys in the country, and companies like that. And we asked the question, well, how many other companies owe this type of money to New York? And uh, we didn't like the, the, the pace of their responses, so we pushed for legislation, which they did anyway without legislation. There's now a website on the tax department's website uh, posting the top 250 tax delinquent businesses and individuals in New York State. And it turns out there were billions of dollars in uncollected revenues in the state of New York. And I, my curiosity is, how about the city of New York? So, I mean, same thing about the question of saying no. I think that that's going to that's It's gonna not what happen. you do in a campaign. No, it's, right, not, it's right. not what we do in a campaign. But I think the creativity of this next city council, and you're seeing four of us talk about that. We have that energy. There's 20, 21 new members of the city council. And we're going we're gonna to change the game. We're going to change the way we understand the needs of our communities and figuring out how we can work together to do that. That camaraderie wasn't necessarily there before. We're going to create that. Uh, and with our new mayor, and I think there's a lot of alignment to understanding how the city chose the next mayor, uh, chose the next controller and the public advocate. And we are now aligned. And so it's going to be up to us to figure out how we do that uh, in a way that's never been done before. Well, it's interesting when you say you're aligned, you're also an equal branch of government. I mean, do you see situations in which you're going to bang heads with the mayor? Uh, if I can go first, I, I think what, what I'm hoping that, that I get clarity on are some of the things that I talked about in my campaign, which are municipal voting rights for, 
for immigrants. Uh, which he is not in favor of. Well, wh which I, at I'm, this point, I, I'm trying to figure out if, right. if maybe we can we can kind of talk about that because it's an important thing for for Sunset Park, where we have 35 percent uh, Asian community, first first immigrants. Um, and well, you uh, have a Latino. large African community, I think. Absolutely. In, in your West African and Latino. Yeah, mm -hmm. in your district. And those are the voices we need and in you have city a, government. You have a large Dominican, and you have a large Eastern Eastern European, and and, and, and a lot Asian. of uh, and a lot of Asian, Over and I third, think a significant yeah. pal there's a significant uh, pal uh, Palestinian community. Yes, I think in your district. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of history in in immigrants voting in municipal elections before. And so we need to restore those rights and well, bring history, those voices. I think in school board elections and stuff. In, in, uh, across the board. But what, what I'm hoping is that that's one issue that I think we're going to have to, to, to talk it through. Uh, and I'm excited to do that in the city council. I mean, what else, anybody else about well, look, knocking York, heads with the mayor? Look, New York, what, one of the things that a council is supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, look, well. New Yorkers want a city council that is going to work with the mayor to get things done, to get results for the city, and to move a progressive agenda. But... New Yorkers also want a city council that's going to be willing to stand up to the mayor at times. Uh, and, and there's a balance there. And I know all of us, when we talk to speakers candidates, are probing for whether they have an understanding of the need to be balanced. Uh, there's no doubt that no mayor and no city council are going to agree on everything 100% of the time. And that's even true when we share an ideology with the incoming mayor. And you know what? I, I, I know Mayor-elect de Blasio well enough to know that he doesn't want a rubber stamp city council. He was there himself. He understands the value of the body. He wants it to be a chamber where new ideas percolate up. Whether yeah, but he was there, but he was there debate. in the beginning under Mayor Giuliani, which was, you know, a slightly, a, you know, a, uh, let's say not quite as much of an ideological agreement. I mean, you know, you had, a, you had a, you know, you clearly had a tension because you had such, you know, dramatically different ideologies between the mayor and the uh, and the council. Now you have. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, oh, oh. I find it hard to believe you're going to match totally in lockstep, but yet you're going to oh. march much more in lockstep than you. I think where you, you may see some of the differences are priorities. Um, we have unions that have not had contracts in years. They're looking for retroactive money. I know many of us in some of the boroughs that have been dealing with school closures mm. um, are trying to see if we can, you know, somehow retract a lot of that. Mm. And, you know, I really want to deliver to my district. Um, people in my community need jobs. We have a lot of development projects. We possibly may have a soccer stadium in, in the Bronx. We have the Kingsbridge Ice Arena. Uh, we have a new Marriott Hotel being built. We have a lot of development, and with all of that comes construction jobs, apprenticeship programs. We need to be able to deliver. So where I see we may have some differences is how do we prioritize prioritize within some of our limitations. We have to reduce waste. We have millions of dollars that come through the city budget every year. We have loopholes that, you know, we can jump through because they're so wide. We have to figure out how to be more efficient with what we have and also be creative at the same time. Um, the degree to which ideology bumps up against reality, which is, you know, which is inevitable. I mean, even in an area like um, affordable housing, that uh, there's increasing, you know, you talk about the unions. But I mean, if you look at non-municipal unions, con 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 construction unions, uh, you know, we have a living wage bill, but there were, mm -hmm. but still, it costs a lot more to build housing, paying union wages and union benefits than it does if a developer is able to bid out to whoever is going to give them, is, is, you know, is going to give, you know, whatever subcontractor. You know, you could wind up in a situation where affordable housing, for instance, is being built more expensively than market rate housing which is i mean so it's a you know there's kind of degrees in which ideology bumps up against mm -hmm. you know against the, the, cause mm -hmm. that kind of seems like a strange i think we should be very careful that we yes. don't pit low-income tenants against the working men and women of the building trades and i think we all support creation of as much affordable housing as possible mm -hmm. and we i think all of us view the building trades as an incredible credible credible vehicle for the middle class these are, these are solid jobs. Right. And, and my vision is that we put the resources into affordable housing so that we're able to build strong and safe and have prevailing wage standards in a way that's going to guarantee we have good jobs for New Yorkers, something we desperately need, but that we don't sacrifice a single unit of affordable housing, that we fund it at a level that allows us to build and build it the right way. Do you believe, that, I'm going to ask each of you this, I and mean, because we do have, you were brought up the question of retroactive pay, um, you know, even... Even Joe Loda, who the Republican nominee, said that there has to be some some degree of retroactive pay, but to but but to make municipal unions whole, mm -hmm. 
is an, is an $8 billion hole. Yep. And uh, can you see, I mean, do you think it should be, do you think it's most likely to be something less than full retroactivity? These are, I know these are kind of uncomfortable questions coming out of a, I think but, that's, a but that's the old report. I think it's a strong possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Albany when we had to vote on tier six, mm -hmm. and that was a tough that's vote a for new, many to, of us. To new it's a new system. retirement, new pension system. At a system, lower level. At benefits. a lower age, right. And I voted no. And I can tell you that I voted no because I wanted to provide a way to incentivize young people graduating from college with tremendous amount of college debt to join the public workforce. And as we are aging out some of our older municipal workers, we're not replacing those jobs. They're just going out through attrition. And I felt that the, there is no way to create a workforce where you have a younger population. So I see where the state was going in that direction, and I know that many of the labor unions have been without a contract for many, many years. So to the degree that we can attempt to start addressing some of those contracts, I'd say we really start with the union that has been without a contract for the longest, because you may be a smaller union, and I don't think you should be outweighed by a larger union just because of their membership. I think everyone is entitled to a wage increase. Everyone is entitled to a collective bargaining agreement, and I think we really have to prioritize with that because we don't have $8 billion. Well, the, the, these are tough economic tough. times, it's, and it's mm -hmm. tough for the New York City budget, and, and Mayor Elect de Blasio is not going into this blind. He understands that. I think all of us understand that. But it's really important to emphasize this has been an era in New York and elsewhere where public sector employees have been demonized. Right. They are blamed and, and, and often ridiculed in unacceptable ways. Mm -hmm. And the truth is these are the men and women who keep New York City running. They educate our kids. They move our transit. They keep us safe. They help promote our health. And we need this to be the best supported, best trained, most respected workforce it possibly can be for New York City to run well. And, and yeah, they should be paid a decent salary at a time when mm -hmm. costs are going up in every aspect of life, from housing to food to transportation. To keep people zeroed out year after year after year is a hardship. And we have to be sensitive to that as people who are going to be stewards of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, let me go to uh, questions. Tell us your name, if you would, and, the, and your campus. Hi, my name is Shauna Bell, and I'm from John Jay College. My question is, with all these issues um, arising, what's the number one issue you guys would like to tackle first when you are on the council? Okay. Priorities. What's your, what's your top priority? Mm -hmm. uh, the issue that comes up time and time again uh, and, and something that I see visibly is, is the damage done by Superstorm Sandy. Uh, and I think that there's a number of steps that we have to do. I think uh, Councilman uh, Electman Chaka mentioned uh, there's legislation uh, that was b being pushed by Councilman Richards mm -hmm. I mean, from Queens uh, to from create- the Rockaways, which is also- Right, mm -hmm. that was hurt by Sandy, uh, to bring transparency, to have basically an online tracker database mm -hmm. to, to monitor where the Sandy recovery money uh, is going. I think that's critical. Uh, and again, to me, these are issues that supersede politics. We should not be manipulating this process. There are families who are hurting. During my campaign, um, some people were saying that Coney Island is back, and I said it's not back until our families are back and until vital services are restored. Uh, their library was shut down for over a year. A health center in the west end of Coney Island is still destroyed. Uh, so, and there are people living with mold in NYCHA, NYCHA apartments that have sewer backups. Whenever it rains on Mermaid Avenue, it's flooding going into people's homes again. So to me, first and foremost, making sure we, re we return a sense of normalcy and safety to the families in my district. Jobs, 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 jobs. It's the best social program we can have and everything flows from a job. Housing, health care, economic development, um, quality of life, improving your life and having families that are really building sustainable careers and able to take care of themselves and their family. Um, I represent, again, a county that has one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. So I deal with that reality every day. Young people need jobs. They need apprenticeship programs. They need training. If we are not um, eligible, get us on track to be eligible. Get us trained so that we can get these public sector construction jobs in industries that build college and, and training. But yet you do what? have, I mean, you, you mentioned the hotel, the King's yep. Bridge Armory, and the, the potential of the soccer stadium mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, leaving the Flushing Meadow Park and coming up. Yeah. So you actually have the potential. For yes, a, we do. A significant amount. Absolutely. Of so I'll talk about education. Uh, and both jobs and Superstorm Center are going to be something we all work together. But I think what, what I want to make sure that we, we tackle on are some very specific things that are happening in Sunset Park, for example, where we need a new elementary uh, school. Uh, and 
the school construction authority has already put money aside and has designated that we need a school but we haven't found a site. So these little things that, that offer an opportunity for us to improve our education system to make sure that we get those preschool slots into our communities when we get that funding and make sure that we have facilities to host the, the preschool programs. Uh, and so I want to be ready to make sure that we have a, a, K, a pre-K through 12 experience for our communities and so many of our communities are immigrant based and uh, uh, I went to Head Start. I was one of the first Head Start babies, uh, and my mom took me took me to Head Start so I could speak English. I, we, didn't, we were a Spanish-speaking family. Uh, that's what I'm experiencing as a need for our immigrant-based communities. Uh, so education is going to be a big. Uh, in my in, in, in my district, the number one crisis is affordable housing. In Upper Manhattan, rents are rising, uh, and tenants who are in stabilized units are are really in jeopardy because of unscrupulous landlords who are stopping at nothing to push out longtime tenants, even tenants who pay their bills, the, the rent every, t every month on time and are great neighbors, but they're being pushed out because landlords know they can jack up the rent two or three times. And one of the ways they're able to do that is because housing court is an incredibly unequal playing field. Mm -hmm. Essentially 100 percent of landlords have attorneys in housing court. For tenants it's 10 percent or less. So landlords know they can drag tenants into housing court even on bogus charges, and tenants will be intimidated, they might settle. I'd like to see the same kind of guarantee in housing court that we have in criminal court, which is everyone should have an attorney or a legal advisor. I think the city could fund that. I think it's something that we could probably find the funding for it in the city council, and it would change the playing field for tenants in a major way. Of course, we've got to build new affordable housing as well, um, and the new mayor is deeply committed to this. He set out a goal of building and preserving 200,000 units of affordable housing. And all our districts are hoping to see some of that um, so that New York remains a place that not only the millionaires can live, but people in the middle class and lower income folks can continue to call home because that's what makes this a city we love. Um, by the way, I, was also, I remember from being a reporter in Brooklyn that Sunset Park had some of the lowest number of park acres of any neighborhood mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the city. That's so right. The park name was kind of strange. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Jairo Guerra, and I attend Lehman College. And my question to each of you is the following. Uh, new faces are in the city council next year. What new things will you, will you bring to your respective districts uh, that the incumbent has not done? And if there exists, what policy, policy or policies will you keep or continue when you assume office next year? Why don't we start with you since yeah, you're the Yeah, I, I, I did an incumbent. <laughs> yes, uh, which is very very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think one of the things that I want to bring to the next city council office is a commitment to community organizing. And what I think when we all talk about all these issues, these are kind of top heavy conversations, but the number one thing that our council offices need to do is respond to crisis. And Superstorm Sandy was one of them. And I think every city council office should be able to do that uh, effectively and have community organizers as staffers. So not only are we dealing with the legislation and making sure that we have the politics right, we need to be able to respond directly with community organizing. Uh, and, and so that's something that I'm going to bring that was not there before. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, with, I mean you, for instance, are, are replacing Dominic Recchia, who was the finance chair, which is a uniquely powerful position in being able to bring the bacon home. So I'm told. To the uh, <laughs> district. Now, this is the politics part of government. Um, you're going to be a freshman. Um, is that a is that a hard act to follow? See, I'm a Dominic fan. But, <laughs> you know, no, there's no question that Councilman Recchi has been very effective uh, in getting resources, um, you know, to his district and even across the city. You know, there are different approaches to, to public service. I, I still believe that this is an honorable profession when when you enter it. I think for the right reasons. Um, I came from an office where constituent services were, were the main priority. So some people, some elected officials might, you know, throw member items here and there uh, to maybe garner support. I'm a big believer in investing money to service people because ultimately our job is to help and service our constituents and to really empower them. Uh, empower them with truth, with information. And um, so, so to me, I, I plan to have very aggressive, engaged, constituent service outreach program uh, in, in my district. And I believe that that's how you also gain power and gain strength, by servicing and empowering people. 
You're right. replacing Helen Foster, is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> who was, who succeeded her father. Yes. It's kind of been a family district for yes. 20 years. Almost. Well, the first thing is my last name is not Foster. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think, you know, one of the advantages I bring is I'm a sitting elected official, so I have an incredible staff now in mm -hmm. Albany and in the district that has done a tremendous job in constituent services. One of the things I'm known of is I, I go everywhere, whether it's 10 people or 100. I show up at events in the district, and I'm always visible, even when I was in Albany. Albany, and I will continue to do that and be committed. One of the things my predecessor did through her father as well was we have neighborhood councils on housing, on youth, seniors, uh, health, education, small business. So we have established entities of residents in the district that are really the eyes and ears for the member. They meet every month in her office and they give her an update on community issues. We talk about relevant policy issues and we actually host events. We do housing forums, we do youth speak outs, we do safety forums and that I have committed to continuing because it gives me eyes and ears already in addition to the base that I've already established so I've done a lot of creative things in my assembly office I do summer office hours at the subway station every summer which I think is great you have to talk to people where they are at the bodega at the supermarket I go to churches every week so I'm very visible and I talk to people sometimes too much <laughs> everyone has my cell number um, but I am trying to make sure that the office always has a presence and people know they can always Always get help from us. Robert Robert Jackson is the one that you're succeeding. Uh, somebody I'm, who's been kind of the center of education debates, you know, going back even to the uh, to the um, uh, campaign for fiscal equity. Uh, I'm lucky to be following such such a great city council member, and certainly big shoes to fill. Um, uh, I'll mention one issue that I want to focus on, which is mass transit. Uh, Upper Manhattan, very low rate of car ownership, maybe 20 percent. So for us, the buses and subways are a lifeline. Uh, but the buses are moving at a snail's pace. 125th Street, which is part of my district, we've now measured the bus speed is actually slower than walking speed. And 125th Street is a major corridor for commerce and, and other purposes. And I'm a big proponent of a solution to this, which is select bus service. Which they've announced SBS that they're looking at now, right? Indeed, indeed, with a quirk, which is that <laughs> true SBS service requires a dedicated bus lane, right? That way the bus can move through traffic, right. not getting caught the way that most buses would. But the current plan uh, creates a bus lane, bus only lane, east of Lenox Avenue to the East River on 125th Street, but not west into my district over to the Hudson. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to have the great benefit of SBS, and I'm going to fight really hard to amend that plan so we can get rapid bus service on 125th Street. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Monica Palacios. I am from Queens College. Uh, my question will be for Carlos Menchaca. Um, I am an Ecuadorian immigrant, mm -hmm. and I've been working in the Ecuadorian consulate for quite some time. And I can see at first, uh, firsthand the suffering or the problem our immigrant community has. So I would like to ask you what are the main goals and the main policy that you're going to do in, in right now in the consul, especially with immigrants, yeah. illegal immigrants. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's 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 going to be a big priority. We already talked about municipal voting rights, and I want to make sure that's something that we do in our first term. Uh, we also need to make sure that we have language, uh, or we, we need to decrease the, the number of issues around language barriers to our services. There's so many services right now that everyone can access, but because of the language barrier, and some of these agencies do not have adequate people being able to communicate to our immigrant communities, that's going to be something that's going to be a priority for us in the city council. Um, in, this, in my own city council office, I'm going to make sure that we have multiple uh, languages spoken, all the languages. Uh, it's Chinese, the three dialects, Mandarin, uh, Fuganese, and uh, Cantonese. Uh, Arabic and Spanish and so I need to make sure that we we can speak the languages in our in our communities um, but also we need to make sure that we we take the the immigration legislation that we've already been passing uh, like the deportation law that we that we that we uh, that we passed in the City Council and make sure that's fully funded and make sure we bring more legal services to our immigrant population and we're waiting for the federal government to do their job they're not doing it we need to be able to do that here in the City Council and make lives for immigrants better let me let me ask you, I want to go back to a question, but I want to ask you kind of a kind of a very brief one or two word answers working off of that. What committee do you want to be on? <laughs> you have really? to guess. Uh, no, I mean, obviously, education um, is, is one of the key committees. Teacher, what, what, what committee would you want to be on? 
Land use. Land use. <laughs> was one of the one of the powers where jobs and jobs, jobs. and development are concerned. <laughs> Public housing, uh, economic development, immigration. I want to be a big leader in immigration. Well, as a former public school teacher and a public school parent, I'm going to fight very hard for a seat on the education committee. But because of the needs of my district, for sure, housing and transportation will be at the top of my and, list. And, and talking about committees, this is, I want to ask, oh, you know, because I do want to go back, I want a yes or no answer. One of the things that the council does is provide Lulu's uh, mm -hmm. extra stipends for people who are committee chairs. This is something that is controlled mm -hmm. historically. Whatever, you know, it could change with the rules you come up with mm -hmm. that. Uh, you get extra money for chairing a committee. Do you, right. do you, so I'll start with you, do you support the continuation of Lulu's? I don't actually. I think it's become another way for a speaker to exert okay. under control. Do you I do not support Lulu's. I do support Lulu's. I think if you are given a chair, such as like transportation or housing, which provides, you need more resource, resources to, and staff to adequately serve as a chair. So if you're given extra, Absolutely, why not? I, I've pledged against <laughs> Lulu's, and if, if received, they'll give it to charity. Well, and just to be clear right. really yeah. quick, it, it's, it's, there's two different types. One is a personal income increase. It's and a, then, I'm talking about the personal income yeah, increase. Yeah, and then the second increase is what I think Vanessa was talking so, I mean, about. In, in terms of committee chairs getting a higher salary, the council member themselves, which is uh, what happens now, as you have in Albany. Oh, see, I was never a part of that. I was only there for four years. Right, no, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so I was still at the bottom. Because I do support that uh, as committee chairs, we should get extra staff. Oh, okay, yeah. that's so what I, I was I asking. I I'm want... talking in terms of staffing and resources. No, I was yeah. talking yes. about in terms of, the, you know, there's actual extra salary that goes with a chairmanship. I mean, you may get, I think it was like $28,000 a year if you're in finance, $10,000 if you're on this committee. You know, there's a... Yeah. There's a whole, there's like a Lulu list, which as reporters, we used to love to go over. Yeah, so, right. So that was, yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Adialo. Um, I'm a senior at Janje College. Uh, my question goes to uh, um, Council Member Miss uh, Jepson. Um, I want to ask you, um, as you pointed out, um, the West African population is one of the gro growing population in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and then um, but they are less involved in um, the decision um, making level. So what have you done so far um, to approach them and, and to make them really involved or what would you be done, what you will be uh, doing uh, for um, the ne your next term? Thank you. And also, just to kind of follow up on that, uh, we experienced it with the Dominican community we talked about first, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Russians, uh, West Africans, voting um, comes after citizenship. So right. the population is there before they're able to actually vote. Right. So, so, I mean, uh, I think it's a very good question right. about, about how, how you integrate African, mm -hmm. West African. I've history. had a great relationship with the African community, uh, growing from West Africa. Many of them are from Nigeria, Ghana, Guinea. And mm -hmm. one of the things that my predecessor did was she had an African uh, leadership council. And the borough president of the Bronx has an African advisory council. So we work with these councils and we hold citizenship forums. We talk about housing, which is very important to the African community. I'm a huge supporter and I will push to get the city to recognize the Muslim holidays in our school system because I think it's important for children to be able to um, respect their religious observances and not get criticized for not being in school. Um, one of the things that I am looking to do first is my staff is always going to be diverse. I have two uh, staff who are from Ghana that speak the dialect that are on my staff and I will absolutely make sure that I always keep that in mind and really work with them. I visit mosques. I visit all of the organizations. We get together on a frequent basis and we really talk about the issues that are of, of growing concern that many of them are small business owners so there has been a huge effort to really tax a lot of our small businesses and we need to do away from that so we need to support them absolutely so I've been working with them and I will continue to do that through advisory councils and town halls and forums Which I think affects everybody's mm -hmm. district. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely yes ma'am we're Good night. running my short name is of five Michelle minutes. Harris from Councilmember Gail Brewer's office and I go to John Jay College um, oh. this my question is for Councilmember elect Vanessa Gibson I actually attended the Torth Nitra with Councilmember elect Carlos Mancha uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I saw the devastation that Sandy had on them. And my question to you is what would the top two issues be for the Bronx district that you're in charge of? What are the top priorities that you'd bring to the council 
um, what are the methods that you would use to amend it, to fix it, and what would be the uh, budget, the funding that you would require for it? Okay, if the question is as it relates to public housing, um, because I am gaining about five public housing developments in Morrisania, Forest, uh, Gouverneur, Butler, McKinley, I have Highbridge Gardens, mm -hmm. Sedgwick, and um, I have another development, uh, Highbridge Gardens in, in the district. And first, the thing that I would do is we have got to stop warehousing our homeless population. We have a tremendously long waiting list. The mayor zeroed out the priority of homeless families going into public housing. I think that needs to change. Um, I'm a huge supporter and will do everything possible to provide cameras and security in my, my NYCHA developments. We need to change the process by which tenants are getting necessary repairs in their apartments. The only people who are getting new appliances in NYCHA are brand new residents. And we have a lot of long-standing tenants that have been disserviced for quite a bit of time. Um, another thing that I would do is we need to talk about a rental a subsidy program. We really are not dealing with Section 8 anymore. Many tenants are not okay. getting new Section 8 vouchers. Uh, advantage is gone. We have nothing in the city to really provide the assistance that families need. So Let I will me, work on that. We only have two minutes left. Let me get a last question in, please. Hello. Um, I'm Doria Josma. I attend um, John Jay. Um, my question is, um, due to um, economic hardship here in the city, how can the NYC Council and the mayor work harder and make better strides to receive sufficient funding from the state? Sufficient funding for? From the state. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to. <clears throat> how can we get funding from the state? How do you get funding from the state? I mean, for instance, do you believe that, um, we don't have much time left, do you believe that uh, that in an election year in Albany that they're going to approve a uh, personal income tax surcharge on people over five hundred thousand dollars? I think Governor Cuomo very much wants to have a good working relationship with Mayor. It's a different question. I, I, think <laughs> I think they'll try and work something out. If if I'm getting the gist of the question, though, we have to point out that New York City gets nowhere near its fair share of resources. We send right. far more money to Albany than we're getting back. It's right. profoundly unfair. And I know all of us would advocate for changing that. Right. Um, same, I mean, do you believe that the uh, mayor will get his surcharge? Will the mayor get his surcharge? I think we're, we're going to find out in the coming months. Uh, I think that the first thing will happen in January, February, that they'll come up to Albany, make their formal requests and meetings. We'll get a, a good feel of that. But I just want to add that not just from Albany, but I really want to zero in, are there delinquent major corporations not paying their fair share to, to New York City? Let me, I, just get the, I just got the goodbye Sorry. sign. Yes. I have never missed deadline, and I want to thank you all, and we'll see you right. next time. Good luck to all of you, and good luck to all of us. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.